All right. I wanted to do this since he won the NCAA cross country championships last fall, but we finally got a chance to make it happen. Charles Hicks, welcome to the City of Smag podcast. So you're here with uh, some big news. You want to share with the listeners what exactly it is? Absolutely. Yeah. Huge news. Super exciting. Um, I've just signed with Nike and joined the Bowerman team. Uh, been training here for about a week and it's been absolutely amazing so far. So how did this all come about? Obviously, back in like March, it was you signed the NIL deal with Nike, the first for, you know, a distance runner in the NCAA. Uh, and then you had an awesome outdoor championship. So to get to this point, how did everything align? And I guess what went into the decision to, you know, forgo the rest of the NCAA eligibility and turn pro? Absolutely. I mean, it's a huge question. There's so much that goes into it and, and so much I've been pondering over since, you know, pretty much November. Um, obviously the NIL situation materialized after that, that was just an amazing opportunity to sort of dip my toe into, um, sort of talking to the people that are involved in these kinds of decisions, you know, getting a feel for, for what this process looked like, which was really great to, to kind of have a grounded, um, have grounded experience with it before you know the real conversation started um and then it was kind of just you know considering what my i wanted my future to be you know i wanted to be a professional runner for just so so long at this point and it is not the easiest thing to pull off um and so i was kind of aware of that the uh risks associated um and you know the position i was in at the end of the year it just you know i was having an amazing time at stanford it was an incredible training situation but I think, you know, looking ahead to Paris 2024, stuff like that, um, there were just all these different factors that, that made me feel like it was, it was a good time to uh, take that next step um, and just to sort of, you know, jump in head first, be a little brave. And, uh, and uh, so when I, I kind of started leaning that direction, you know, it was all kinds of con conversations, negotiations that, you know, unfolded over a matter of weeks. It was, I was, I was trying to kind of, keep that all sideline, focus on the NCAA season, you know, get the job done um, and do my best in that circuit. But yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible how it unfolded, you know, to have it behind me now is, is also pretty nice just to be focused on training currently and uh, performing it as best as I can. But yeah, it was a real, to be honest, it was really a whirlwind, um, but one that I was, I was very happy to be in. I guess it's gotten so different since NIL came into play. And can you put us basically in your driver's seat? You just kind of explained the overview of it, but where does where someone start? Like if, you know, yes, you have to run well, you have to perform and have a pretty solid resume to, you know, explore the option of turning pro. And so there might be people out there who are younger or still in college listening to this. And they're like, I don't know how that process works. So for you, where did you sort of turn for that kind of stuff? You know, there's sometimes, you know, previous blog posts that someone maybe has done, it's like advice for people turning pro, but where did you look? What I was saying is that the best place to look, I, I thought was where it already happened. So I'm not sure what Caitlin Tui did in her situation because she was really the pioneer. Um, but I think by the time I was sort of looking at it slash, you know, being eligible to be in a situation like that, um, I'd seen that she'd signed with Adidas. Um, and so I was trying to sort of figure out, you know, what, what she'd done. And I saw that she worked with an agency to sort of secure a deal like that. Cause I'd talked to, you know, I'd managed some of my own stuff at that point, but nothing quite on that scale. Um, and so I reached out to the agency. It was just curious. It didn't honestly, uh, even after winning NCAAs, I it didn't seem like it was, it was, um, a hundred percent going to be in the cards, but it just kind of, you know, they were able to, to talk to their contacts um, and, and see whether or not that was going to be a reality. And then when it looked like it was going that way, it was really exciting. And uh, we just, uh, yeah, we just capitalized on that. And it was just, it was just incredible because, you know, you really feel like you're at the start of something completely new and, and something that could be incredibly beneficial, I think, for a lot of athletes, especially in the smaller sports. So it was really fun just to be able to get experience for myself and then also share experience with my teammates, you know, negotiation wise, making connections, um, you know, working with an agent on something that, you know, while you're still able to stay in college. Um, and I think it's just extremely valuable to, to get those kinds of experiences. So in Austin, you go one, two with Kai in the 10 K 
and then you finish sixth in the 5K. How do you feel about those being your final races in a Stanford uniform? And what made you feel like, all right, you know, I've kind of done what I've wanted to, and it's time to look ahead to turning pro? Absolutely. I mean, each of those races is incredibly special in its own way. Obviously, going one and two is just a huge symbolic, um, real physical manifestation of a lot of the work we've been putting in. You know, arguably, we haven't been able to capitalize exactly how we've wanted to every championship. But, you know, that was just something that, that really hit, I think, you know, from a team perspective. And it just really made me feel good about, you know, what we've been able to build this past four years. So that was really incredible in its own right. Amazing to see Kai launch into, you know, this next phase of his career that I think we've all thought he's ready, been ready to be in for, for a long time now. Um, and then the 5K was incredible as well you know, to have Kai win it. And then, you know, we also just got enough points to secure third as a team. You know, with only three guys scoring is just, I mean, I think that's pretty much the best way possibly, you know, could end up. So absolutely, absolutely incredible way to end it. Um, you know, just that's why you're there. You're there to contribute to a team. And and I think, you know, putting my head down and getting that done was was extremely rewarding. And then as far as it goes for the next phase, you know, um, I think, you know, it's just a whole different ball game. I think even in this one week, I've realized, you know, at this level, that stuff really doesn't matter. You know, that's all in the past. Kind of like when you get to college, you know, the high school accolades just kind of go out the window. It's what got you there. You know, it's not really something laurels you can rest on. And I think that's when I perform best in an environment where, you know, I'm just pining away. It's essentially like a complete fresh start. And um, I've really appreciated just being able to, to tackle a whole new range of challenges and uh, yeah, it feels like I'm on a new frontier. So one week in Park City, what is sort of like that rookie feeling feel like? And it, especially in workouts, like you're at altitude now. So like that's got to yeah. be tough. In it its own it right. feels like uh, being about to throw up after <laughs> every rep. Um, it's been unbelievable. And I think, you know, there are so many reasons why I wanted to come out and join this this roster and this team. And um, even in the first week, it's just extremely apparent that this is the perfect environment uh, for me. I think, you know, we've already done workouts that, you know, would pretty much have been impossible for me before, but I think it's just having so many, you know, world championship Olympic quality guys in a train that I can just hop, you know, into and be a part of um, just really elevates every athlete. And, you know, I think a lot of people think you, you become the average of the, the people you spend the most time around. And, and these guys are just absolute best in the world. Um, and so, it's it's been absolutely amazing and rewarding to to join you know you know these kinds of workouts you know the environment and culture that they have out here and uh take what i've learned from stanford and do do my absolute best to, to try and help them out you're the latest in the stanford to bowerman pipeline that has gone on for years you know the history is there chris derrick you know uh grant fisher elise cranny sean mcgordy i guess what what is it about you know, the Palo Alto to now, I guess it used to be Portland, but now out to Eugene sort of uh, tree that works. It's a great question. Honestly, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's coincidence. I don't know. It's been it's, different coaches too. There. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's really interesting. Um, I think honestly, just part of why I go to Stanford is just that sort of competitive mentality. You want to be at the best of everything you can be. And you know, I think that when you narrow that down, that drive down into one thing, like you kind of just, the, when you decide to, to put it all into running, it's just an extremely effective motivational well to draw from. Um, I know for me already, just sort of leaving some academics behind is just, you know, open up the possibilities of what I can do, you know, recovery, PT, getting in more mileage. You know, I'm up at altitude, but honestly, like I'm more relaxed than I've been in a long time. Um and, you know, that's also why you go to Stanford is you want to get that degree. You want to work hard. And I think, you know, this is a team that that revolves around working hard and an acceptance that, you know, pushing a little bit further um, is going to get you a lot more down the road. So I think maybe it's some of that delayed gratification um, work ethic. If I had to guess. Oh, no. no you're yeah. good. Yeah. OK, I just kind of went low power mode. I don't know why it, it all went by. But um yeah, I think that delayed gratification um, work mindset can can sort of filter you into to joining a team with uh, the way that, that Jerry likes to coach. 
but I mean, it also could be coincidence. I have no idea. I think Stanford, you know, they get incredible athletes and they turn them into even more incredible athletes. So um, it's a bit of a chicken or the egg there. Your dad is a great follow on Instagram, posted some graduation photos of yours. So you talk about the education at Stanford. What are you going to do with this cognitive science degree now that, you know, you, your, your full-time job is going to be professional runner. So that's going to be on ice for a bit. It's in the back pocket. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to monitor, you know, the computer science scene, make sure that I, I don't get too behind the times. But um, I think the focus right now is just to run as well as I absolutely can. And the reason I went to Stanford was really to give myself 100% to running without worrying about the downside of if it doesn't work out. I always talk about the broken leg test. It's a good way to um, visualize, you know, are you going to be happy and safe in a situation if something horrible happens and, and you don't have running to fall back on? And so, you know, we put in the work, we got it done in four years um, and uh, we got that. We, but I, I acknowledge that, you know, that was work and, and, I think the reward now is that, that I have that degree, you know, whenever I need it, but for now, you know, get a 10 year vacation and <laughs> just grind my, grind myself into dirt. So hopefully I my, I won't decline cognitively too much, but you know, we'll see. <laughs> so, you know, one thing that you brought up before was just kind of like this dream of being a professional runner. When did that really start for you? Because, you know, you kind of have set the path in motion, just even committing to Stanford and then having the success that you did. Absolutely. Um, I can pinpoint it pretty much exactly to when we all got sent home for COVID my freshman year. Um, I think when you get to Stanford, there's so many ways and directions that you can succeed that, you know, it, it can be it can be, it's an amazing opportunity, but there's a lot to consider, um, especially, you know, when it's just a whole new world for you. Um, and so I think I just remember, you know, freshman year, I was running okay. I wasn't running bad by any, badly by any means. But when we all got sent home, all I was doing every day was pretty much just training, just trying to get better, running as much miles as I could. I was running way more than I'd ever run before. And I was just so happy to be singularly focused and to just be putting my life into something that, you know, not only was something worth, you know, feeling good about at the end of every day, but at the end of every year, you have this whole almost tapestry worth of, of achievements and, and difficult days to, to look back on and be proud of, uh, irrespective of how your races go. Um, it's more just, you know, a whole workload of, of you know, a certificate of, of achievement. So I think it was just those little gratification moments you know, getting through a 10 mile run, sweating through something in Florida, it just built up and built up. And then when I got back to campus, you know, it was just so, and I guess when I was in Park City too, before we got back to campus during COVID, it was just making me feel incredibly good about myself and there was no race. So I think I knew at that point, I was just in love with purely running. Um, and it's what I want to do for as long as I can possibly do it. And since that point, I've just been gunning it to try and get to it to a similar situation um where you know i can just be singularly focused on that and and i think that stanford was the perfect place uh for me to get here yeah i'm kind of looking at your your stats here now and it's like yeah right be <laughs> before the pandemic it was all you were still a 1500 guy and then kind of what happened during that break that really allows you to come back and then from there on i mean in 2021, you ran 1333. And then from there, we saw that progression that it's gotten you down to 1324. And then in the 10K, 2740. Exactly. Yeah. Honestly, it's astonishing. And, and I think, you know, a huge component was that sort of three month block we had in Park City. Um, I did a lot of uh, intense training in Jacksonville, Florida over the summer before that, and, and sort of half the year after we got sent home. And I think the lack of racing allowed me to push myself a lot harder than I'd been able to previously. I think when I left Stanford, I was running 65, 70, maybe 60, 65 miles a week max. And when I got home, I was like, we have all this energy. We don't need to race ever. Can I go up to like 80 miles? And coach Santos said, yes. And then when we got to Park City, I was like, can I do 85? And he's like, eh, yes. And then um, we've just been gradually increasing it from there. But I think that big jump is really that, 33% increase in mileage, um, getting to hit workouts really hard, doing a lot of longer volume stuff. A lot of the stuff we're doing uh, freshman year is very transitional from 
you know, moving into sort of the workouts that, that coach Santos like to do. Um, and so I think we're really just building up to strength from my freshman year till that sophomore year. But I mean, running's pretty simple. The, the work you put in is usually the, uh, the reward you get out and barring injury, you know, I think it was just, I was able to do a lot more work. I was able to focus on it a lot more. And, and when I decided, you know, this is what I really want to do, I think you're just able to train a lot more effectively. It really showed during the cross country season. And now, you know, kind of as a pro, yes, you know, there are opportunities out there to run cross country. It hasn't been as glamorous in recent years, but it's still got its historical prestige. You know, the greatest, you know, runners of all time, going back to Kipchoge, Bekele, uh, Paula Radcliffe have all had a really strong cross country background and we're seeing it with Jakob right now. So for you, you know, we've seen what you can do at the college level winning this past year how do you hope to keep that going as a pro and it's like you know there, you just kind of have to hope that there is more cross country in the future for you totally I mean I think it's going to be something we have to play by ear um I'm kind of a guy that just likes to do whatever my coach tells me to do so we'll see you know what the vision is I think the goal is really going to be making it to worlds and olympics um and whether or not we can use cross country to help out in the 10k because that's sort of a new qualification system there. Um, that might be something that's in the cards. But honestly, it's a brave new world. If you asked me how college was going to work at the, this point in my freshman year, I'd have no idea what, what I was in for. So I'm still just kind of taking it as I go, um, learning as much from the guys as I can. And uh, yeah, just, just trying to jump in and... Um, basically get as much out of this as I possibly can before next year, before we're starting making decisions like that. So yeah, cross country has always had an amazing um, part of my life and my running experience. If there's a way I can keep that going, I absolutely will. But you know, future is wide open. Uh, yeah. so I'm not going to put myself in a corner and uh, I'm just going to keep enjoying. It. So going back to last November, can you kind of describe like a little, it was probably mixed feelings at the end of the day. There's the thrill yeah. of winning individually, but then the team finishing fourth and maybe not having the day that it that everyone had hoped for. So, for you, how did you kind of you know celebrate? Then at the same time, you know, taper that down around the rest of the team. What happened basically after the ESPN broadcast stopped? I mean, my team was absolutely incredible about it. Obviously all of us wanted that win more than anything. We, we sacrificed so much. I mean, everyone, every one of us put in, you know, the same work. And as I said earlier, you know, running is really what you get out, what you put in, but injury can come out of nowhere. All these factors that sort of swim around, it can affect it, um, you know, by proximity. And um, it was difficult because I, I was watching guys who worked, you know, just as hard as I had, and it just didn't come together on the day. And, so that part of it was difficult, but I think I came in with that expectation that it was like, yes, this is incredible, but, but obviously we had this team, uh, our team situation didn't go as well as we wanted to. So, you know, maybe we got to, got to appreciate, you know, not, not go over the top and, and just try and make it all about me, but every single one of my teammates was beyond empathetic. They were all just excited, you know, that I, that I had gotten up there and, and uh, done what I wanted to do, you know, for so long. And, and even though we didn't get it as a team, I think, you know, it was really heartening for me to even then just have my teammates get so much out of that performance that we were able to sort of salvage the mood, so to speak. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, it's still, we're still always going to want it, have wanted to have gotten it, but there's only so much you can do. And, and, you know, that's, that's the past at this point. So I think, yeah. I think it's just something you reflect on and you learn from it as much as you possibly can. You know, I think if you win absolutely everything in this sport, you get so much less out of it. So I think each of us will take a lesson from it at the very least, if not many lessons. And um, it's just a part of life. And yeah, you just, you just got to keep trying as much as you can. The team is in good hands. They've got a really strong recruiting class coming in. So not all that worried about Stanford making the podium and potentially winning, you know, one of these upcoming years. So for you, this final season, this final year was basically like you had a pretty roller coaster ride of, of emotions and highs. You know, it was basically after that, how did sort of winning NCAAs change 
you know, expectations and maybe a little bit of added pressure going into that indoor season, which wasn't perfect. And then from then on, you kind of used it to put a target on the outdoor season, even training through Pac-12 championships, which I think I saw online that you ran like 115 miles that week or whatever it was. And, and this is a hundred. Yeah. Just a, okay. yeah. And, then, and then from there, you know, getting the job done finally at the championship. So for you, how did you navigate all of that in this final year? I mean, I think a lot of it's just preparation for, you know, the way the professional circuit works, the way that I believe the sport functions, which is just, you know, it's, it's a sum of what you put in. And, and I think indoor season's always been trickier for me. I think as a higher volume athlete, it's very hard for me, especially running euros, which is only a couple of weeks later, but um, it's just hard for me to get up to fitness, you know, even by the time that, that March rolls around. So I kind of went into the season expecting, you know, it to be a difficult ride up i had a difficult indoor season the year before as well um and was able to to come away with a third place in the 3k the previous year but the 3k was a lot less of a test of fitness more of just a sit and kick than I, a 5k at altitude was and so i'm not altogether convinced that my fitness level was was that different between the two years i think it was just two very different races and um honestly i was just comfortable with the reality of the situation that you, you can't go out and win every race um you have to keep working and 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 i didn't know what was going to happen beyond even outdoor so um i don't think it was particularly difficult for me to move on from that i think i knew what i wanted i wanted to be as competitive and outdoor as i possibly could be i think you know i achieved that goal at the end of the year i was in a great great fitness um i guess that was only a couple of weeks ago still I am in, in great fitness and, and the ball's still rolling. And I think a part of the reason why the ball's still rolling is we were patient. Um, and so I think that's just an important lesson for anyone who wants to succeed in a sport that's as cumulative as ours is, you know, the, the races that I'm running now are probably built upon the foundation that, that we built even back in high school. Um, and so I think, you know, you have to really sort sometimes quiet those, um, immediate gratification sort of rewards that seem so right around the corner because if you over pursue those you might end up sacrificing things you know way down the road that you never even dreamed you could have gotten so I think I've had learned a lot of lessons like that in the sport and it sort of helped me um, not worry so much about what's right around the corner and just make sure I'm focused more on a uh, process goals getting my training done as well as I possibly can and execution and races is really not all that different you know whether I win a race or whether it's not so great um, it's more of a component of how much I've trained for it. So I try and focus on the training, um, not worry about the results as much. Cause I think, you know, if you get those done, if you stay consistent, that stuff will come with time. Much better and thought out answer than you could have just relied on the excuse of being like, Hey, I'm from Florida and we don't have indoor track out there. I run at a school in California and all we do is run outside. So, you know, I'm not used to indoor track, but you know, that that's the much better answer. <laughs> Um, two word answer I'm soft and altitude is hard <laughs> I guess that's more than two words I thought it was just gonna be I'm soft <laughs> <laughs> so looking ahead you know you've got this roadmap there's so many different ways to get to the world championships you know it's complicated it, the sport it doesn't make it easy for you looking ahead over the next couple of weeks you know you're in Park City now maybe not for that much longer because it's off to Europe so a reminder to people you represent team GB uh, what does it look and look like ahead and what's it going to take for you to hopefully qualify for these world championships? A great question. I, I, I think, you know, I'm, I think we're shooting for the 5k, which is the, the ultimate goal. The 10k is just pretty set. We're not sure how many fast 10ks we're going to go. Um, I think the goal is just to go out and race and, and try and get as many points as we can. I think, you know, we're aware that, the NCAA circuit doesn't set you up necessarily as optimally for making these kinds of meets as, as maybe it could, but we're going to do the best job we can with the time we have remaining about a month or so left to go. <laughs> Went down to 5%. We're still good. But um, yeah, I think we're just keeping the ball rolling. The most important thing right now for me is just, you know, trading with the guys, trying to sync up with them, push the season a little bit later and be able to take my break when they take it. So when we make the build for 
uh, pairs that it can be, you know, very synchronized. Um, but we're going to try and get out of this as much as we can. And, and I think so the goal will be going for points, um, trying to race hard, you know, really get as much experience as I possibly can um, in this first couple months of being a professional. And, and I think you just got to take everything in stride. I think a lot of things are going to go. Wow. That's interesting. I just got two low power notifications. <laughs> I think things are going to go differently from how we expect them. Um, and I think I'm going to learn a lot. So in a long, in a short answer from that long answer, you know, learn as much as possible, you know, don't expect too much, but be grateful for whatever comes and, and just enjoy racing. Cause I think, you know, these meets are so amazing. It's so incredible to make them that I think you can get a little bit lost, you know, chasing them um, as opposed to just, enjoying being competitive you know these amazing opportunities we have to be out here uh competing and i think you know if you focus on enjoying it getting the job done hopefully the points will come all right two final questions before i let you go and before hopefully your ipad doesn't die um first off has jerry given the green light for you to continue posting to youtube and strava your great follows on on both of them Yes. Yes. Strava. It'll be interesting. I'm not, I'm, I'm still deducing the team policy. I have not asked explicitly. I imagine the YouTube will still be okay. I mean, I think the YouTube it's always, you know, I think if it ever got to a point where it was too invasive, you know, that's not even what I really like to do. If you follow me, I think, you know, it's never been really too inside of, of what's going on for other people. Cause I think, you just want to be cognizant. Not everyone wants to be on the camera. Not everyone wants that to be their experience. You know, this is something I love. I love sharing my experience with other people, but that no way, you know, means I'm qualified to, to sort of invade other people's space. So I try to be as mindful of that as I possibly can be. And, you know, there'll, there'll be a lot more YouTube videos down the pipeline for sure though. Um, as for Strava, I think, you know, maybe the workouts aren't going to be up there but honestly like most track workouts you can't even tell what they are on Strava so I'll see I'll see what I can I'll see what what happens there but you know either way I'm sure my followers will get be getting a lot more content than they were when uh when I was doing CS classes every every quarter at Stanford um I will have a lot more free time on my hands um and I'm excited for that and I'm excited to do stuff like this as well um, yeah so nothing but upside there you know whether or not everything is back not sure but, you know, got to respect the wishes of other people. And um, yeah, that's what I'll be trying to do. Final one, Danny Duncan, YouTuber with 7 million <laughs> subscribers. I remember when he was in high school and he helped out a bunch with like Florida Mile Split. And he even like sent me like a Facebook message way back in the day. What, no what was the connection, I guess, like between the two of you? And was there any actual sort of bump that you felt from just like being featured on his videos like whether that would have been like more views or subscribers on your channel i feel like there's a way to utilize these you know youtubers with massive platforms that can be hashtag good for the sport <laughs> yeah there's a lot of conversation about good for the sport stuff like that you know i think our connection is is about the same as as your guys connection he just reached out to me on social media he was driving up through California to go up to see Eugene. I think he wanted to see Pre's Rock. And I told him we had a meet and he swung by. And yeah, it was it was super cool to meet him. I think I agree. You know, exposure for, for the sport is is never going to be a bad thing. Um, I think the best part about track and field is, and I've heard this so many times from so many different people, but I think its strongest aspect is when you have, you know, a dog in the fight, so to speak, when you know and can connect with someone in the race. It just really elevates it. I think above a lot of uh, other spectator sports and on the flip side, I think if you don't really know anyone in the race, you know, the context is really lost. And so it's something I've always tried to do with YouTube. You know, it's something I think is really important for anyone that can get featured that, that that's a track and field athlete and, you know, trying to make those connections between viewer and, and athlete, I think is kind of the future of, of where things could go, you know, whether or not I'm right about that is, is totally up in the air, but it's something I, I think, you know, I would like if I was on the flip side. Um, and so, yeah, that's always been a goal of mine, you know, opportunities like that come around, you know, infrequently. So I thought it was a great time to, to get a track meet, you know, on a platform like that. And it was really cool to meet him. And yeah, it's, uh, it's, I love finding out that, that more people love the sport.
Well, Charles, um, excited for you. Congrats on one turning pro and two the degree from Stanford. Um, and looking forward to to seeing much more from you ahead, whether it's on YouTube, Strava, or at a track meet. So uh, keep up the great work. And it was nice catching up. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.